when it comes to ships, there is one boat that we are all in together. The problem is, sometimes there's mutiny in the boat. Sometimes we try to murder one another in this boat. Last year, we last year, last week, we talked about ownership. And today, man, hi, live stream. It's good to see you up close. Last week, we talked about ownership. Today, we talk about the funnest ship to be in, relationship. So we're going to speak of marriage, uh, but very specifically, we're going to speak of relationships in general. Let me flip that. We're going to speak about relationships in general, but specifically, we will talk about marriage as well. It's something that applies to everyone. Now, I've really got to get cracking today. I need you to take notes. I want you to go home and read up and decide if I'm telling you the truth or not, just like every other week, okay? I'm in Ephesians today. I'm going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. This is one of the big relationship passages in the Word. I've really got to move quickly, so uh, follow with me because we're in this boat together. You will want to uh, write some of this scripture down because it will be important to you because relationships will always be part of your life. Single or married, relationships will be a part of your life. And, and there's, when we're done with today, I don't think that there's anything I necessarily want you to go do. There's a different view that I want you to have. I want you to see relationships through a different view, through a different lens, and that is God's view. Because he's the captain of this relationship, right? He's the captain of this relationship, and there is a way that he wants things done on his boat. Is this analogy working so far? Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to start in verse 15. Pay careful attention then to how you walk, in parentheses, on the ship. Not as unwise people, but as wise. How many of you are disqualified already? <laughs> Making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless living, but be filled by the Spirit. Play offense. I'm not giving into something that's going to make me unwise. I'm going to be wise. And this is how I deal with relationships. I walk in wisdom. This is how I walk. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making music with your heart to the Lord. Would it be a different world if that is how we interacted? And you can do that. And I know what you're thinking. That sounds like a musical. And I don't watch musicals. It, it plays out a little differently than that. Okay, give us a minute. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Did you hear that? You hear Before that? we go any farther, any farther, submitting to one another, one another in the fear, fear of, Christ. of Christ. Why would I submit to anyone, and why would I do that out of fear? It's, it's, uh, once, again, once again, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So why am I submitting to others? Because they deserve it. <laughs> Jesus came from his throne and died for you in your sins? Was it because you deserve it? Okay, submit to one another out of the fear of Christ. Is it because we deserve it? No. My kids are all in the same boat. It's a smaller boat than what we're talking about today because there's just four of them. And I want them to treat one another well. Is it because they deserve it? Let my son go home with you today, and let's have this conversation, okay? Is it because they deserve it? No, it's because this is my son. This is my daughter. This is how I want my daughter treated. This is how I want my son treated. And so we, as Christians, think that there is an intrinsic value, that there is literally a spirit. When God made man, man was just there and void of life until God 
breathe the breath, the spirit, the, the word spirit actually means wind, breath, breathe the spirit of life. And that spirit made him a living living being and so that spirit is, is, is the intrinsic value within that human and we treat people as such because we're all in the same boat because God breathed the spirit of life into you God breathed the spirit of life into the same person that you hate and so we treat people in a certain way we submit to them now when I submit to you uh, we sort of have a, a little bit of a skewed version. That means I play a role like if you rank higher than me. I'm going to treat you like if you are more valuable than me. And, and here's the thing. I'm doing it voluntarily. Okay? It's called humility. I'm doing this voluntarily. Okay? So, uh, out of the respect, uh, I'm sorry, in the fear of Christ. Why? Because you deserve it? No. Because my Father is pleased by it. If you've ever had kids, you will know that, that uh, I will make this assumption about you. The way to your heart is to love your children. Somebody can come up and be of poor character in a thousand areas, but if they love and treat your children well, they're in. They're in like Flynn. I don't know what that means, but I've always heard it, and they're in. Okay? Why? Because it pleases me. In the same way, the Father is pleased when you love his children. So, uh, this is what Jesus did for us. He set the tone. He set the model. He came down, and he died for those who were undeserving, which is us. Now, let's keep going. Verse 22. Wives. Now, we're, we're going to go specifically, this is how we treat one another in general. Submitting to one another is going to carry over into how we treat one another. I am to submit to my wife. My wife is to submit to me. Now, now we're going to hone in on the marital relationship. And in verse 22, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Wives submit to your husband because he deserves it and he's awesome and he's the, 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 the number one. No, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. We're going to get to why here in just a second. Because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Who's the Savior of the body? Your husband? No, <laughs> no, no. I assure you he is not. I'm sure he's great. You married him for a reason. He's not the Savior. Christ is the Savior. And so there is a picture that is going on here. I need you to understand that marriage is actually an analogy. That's why I say if you are a Christian couple, I read secular books all the time, okay? I read secular books all the time. There is advice that I can take about all sorts of things, about finances, about all sorts of things. But when it comes to marriage, there's literally a different goal for a Christian than there is for the world. And so uh, if you're seeing uh, counsel, and I, you guys know how I am about that. I push counseling all the time. Uh, if you are a Christian, you need to seek out Christian counseling over marriage uh, because a secular council literally does not have the same goals that you have. Marriage is about happiness for them. That's not what it's about for us. There is a picture when you're married, and the picture is that uh, the, the husband and wife are a, a mirror image, a representation of Jesus and the church. Okay? And that's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. Like, that's the whole shooting match. That's the point and the goal is that we look like Christ in the church, in marriage. Okay? So, uh, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he's the savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands and everything. Okay? Uh, so, this is a, 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 a this is not a on the knees, I'm less than you. This is a voluntary position. Okay, and so this is important. If you are single and there is there's someone that you're dating, you're considering marrying, but they are not someone that you would volunteer to serve, to elevate, don't do it. You don't have to do it. This is a voluntary position. Okay? It, the, the, this, is, this is something that you sign up for willingly, and if you can't, br don't, j don't. Can I get an amen from the married people in here? Don't do that. Okay? okay, there is, there is, I, this is in my notes for later, but listen, uh, man, Disney's killing us. 
there, there, there's two schools of thought, and, and they're both wrong. One is that there's one special someone for everyone. And, and show me that. Show me that in Scripture. And I'll go show you somebody whose wife or husband passed away, and now they're married to someone new and have a great relationship in both relationships. No, not one special someone for everyone. If you think that, then every time you have problems, it'll be like, I guess I didn't find my one special someone. No, you've got to work on it. Or here's the other problem with that. Uh, someone broke up with you, and now they're in a new relationship, and you're like, I'm just doomed because that was my one special someone. No, obviously not. They are somewhere else. Okay? That is a lie. Man, that is, it's not good. The other side of that pendulum swing is as long as you work on it, you can marry anyone, and it'll work out great. Oh, man. That's not good. That's not good at all. Somewhere in the middle is it's going to take work and it's going to take the right person. Now, there's probably more than one person out there and you're like, well, that's not very romantic. Yes, it is because out of all those that I could have married, I chose you. Not you, you. You know what I'm saying? And that's literally by definition romantic. I chose you. You are my one and only, right? And so maybe this could have worked with someone else, a very small, very few, very select number of someone else's. But there's more than one. There just ain't a lot. So you have to choose and you have to stick. All right? And there's a lot on both sides of that. It's just as hard. You get it just right, and you choose, and you pick, and you follow God. It's still going to be hard. So why do it? Because it's awesome. And it's really hard, okay? What would you say? The, man, i got to get back to my notes. We're in a hurry. But when, when we were getting married, Lane and I got married really young, and it was like, oh, the first year, if you can just survive the first year. And after the first year, we were like, this is really good. Or I was, because she was awesome, but she was probably like, dear God, what did I get myself into? But uh, it, then it was like, oh, no, the first year is easy. Wait till the second year. Wait till the and everybody had all these years. And, man, the negativity that we faced. And, and now, you know what mine is? Like, hey, listen, year 14, you better buckle up. Because the year 14, that's what I think was probably our hardest. Some of you are like, why are you telling me this? Because it's, you never know when. You never know when. But at some point, the proverbial mess is going to hit the fan for you in a relationship. And if you're, if you're on one side going, well, I guess it's not my special someone. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's going to take work. And Jesus tells us that, that it's hard. But listen, that's not even what this whole thing is about. It's about Jesus. Because here's the end of this. With you and Jesus, that's a very difficult relationship. He doesn't always do things in the timing that we want it done. And on his end, I think we probably don't do literally anything right. And he is sticking it out, loving you. And, and that has got to be hard. Read through what he says through the prophets in the Old Testament about how mad he was at his people. And you'll be like, mm -hmm, I feel you. I feel you. I'm sure if my wife could have called down lightning, I'd look like a chicken nugget up here. It's hard. Okay. But we do it for each other. We submit to one another out of the fear of Christ. Wives, submit to your husband. Why? Because he deserves it. Out of the fear of Christ. When you submit. I, I, okay, so I have a lot of weird issues. I don't talk about it a, a lot, but... Um, one thing is my feet. I have really bad feet. And sometimes uh, my wife will sit by me because there are just times I go, I've, I've got to sit down for a minute. My feet hurt so bad. And she will sit down beside me. She will take my shoes off and she will rub my feet. And I can promise you it's not because she just loves feet. And it's not because these little hobbit things on the end of my legs are lovely feet. It's not that either. She does it because she is submitting to me in that moment. And here's the weird thing about submission. That's exactly what Jesus did. He came from the throne and served you. And do you know that when she rubs my feet, she could never be more lovely to me? That is the highest I will ever think of her. You're like, that's really shallow. I'm a man. 
Shallow's my game, baby. That is the highest I will ever view her. Because I'm like, I don't even want to touch mine. And it elevates her. She does this, and she does it voluntary, and in the same way that Jesus is elevated, and he is at the right hand of God, she is elevated in my mind when she serves me. And if you have a wife who will serve you, and you don't elevate her for that, Dusty and I talked about this, and I asked permission to use this word, and we changed this word, and uh, he said, no, I think you need to put it back in there. So I'm going to read what we came up with. There's all kinds of situations in marriage, but as long as only one person, man or woman, gives to the other, it is an abusive relationship. As long as only one of you is giving and the other is not appreciating this, not reciprocating this, it's abusive. I know that's super harsh, but we need to hear that. I know I needed to hear that. I had a man set me down younger in, in my life and younger in marriage and said, this is God's daughter. Think of that. And so while I may be furious out of fear of my God and how I hope that if I have a son-in-law one day, he has a healthy fear of me. And that when he is mad at my daughters, who I'm sure will have done nothing wrong, and he's just a jerk, <laughs> that he that thinks he their dad may murder me. I'm serious. I'm serious. <laughs> I hope that there is a healthy fear. And we need to have a fear of God. And of course, I'm picking on men when I say this, only because women are more vindictive and they don't take examples well. But... That's a joke, y'all. Come on. I had to pick on women a little. Okay, I, but, but I'm, I'm saying this really through a man's point of view, but it's either way. If only one person is serving the other, if only one person is putting in effort, that's an abusive relationship, be it physical, emotional, however you want to look at that. I, d I don't really care. That's just abusive. So it's, it, it's got to be situational. And some of you, uh, there, there, there's, for every person that is in that relationship, somebody's not in that relationship but thinks they are. Okay, so it's, it's all over the board for you, and I'll, I'll let you deal with that. I'm not going to try to list every analogy and example. Husbands, verse 25, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself to her for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. How should you treat your wife? Well, how did Jesus treat you? That's your example. That's your model. And do you know what he did for you? Everything. And do you know how much you deserved it? Zero much. And if you can't do that, the same thing is, is, is our earlier conversation. If there's not uh, someone that you are willing to do this for, die for them when they don't deserve it. Die to your own flesh wants desires, even when they don't deserve it. Don't get married. It's hard enough as it is. Some of you are like, man, I feel good about being single today. And Paul would say you're in a good, good spot. Are you making your wife holy, dying for her, putting her first? Jesus left his throne to serve you? You may have to leave your job. You may have to leave a friend group. You may have to leave a hobby. You may have to leave something in the same way that he did to die for your wife. And that's what we're called to do. Again, it's situational. Man, I, you can't just put a blanket over everything. I know that things get complicated. I'm just saying, when you get stuck, 
How did Jesus treat the church? How should the church respond to Jesus? That is how you view it. Well, my husband ain't Jesus. I, I know. I know. You ain't exactly the Apostle Paul yourself. We're flawed. Okay? I get it. But this is what we go to. How do I honor God through this? And sometimes I have to do it for God because I don't really like you right now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of you are like, I ain't shaking my head. I ain't moving. I ain't taking notes. I got you in a lose-lose. You're like, I don't know what to do right now. Jesus forgave sins. Jesus forgave all of your sins and did not hold them over your head, but gave you forgiveness, redemption. But we're still holding on to stuff, holding it over your head. That's not the way that Christ loved the church. I'm just telling you what the book says, y'all. This ain't, look, I'm not, I'm not perfect at this either. I didn't get an amen, so that's good. Jesus love is a free gift, so husbands, we cannot love our wives based on performance. Let's move on. Verse 29. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. Since we are members of his body, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The analogy. Husbands, you and your wives. Wives, you and your husband are compared to Christ and the church. That's the point. I'm going to reiterate that in just a moment. But this is about to get interesting. The two of you become one flesh. One flesh. Member of his body. Husband and wife. Christ and the church. One flesh. First of all, when you actually become one flesh, that's important. It's actually spiritual. And this is why we reserve that for one person in the same way that our God is faithful to us. It's biblical. It's important. Adults, are y'all tracking with me? Nobody's head nodding me or anything. I'm trying to be like under the level on this. The two of you become one. Now hold on. A picture of Christ in the church. Go back. This is interesting. Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. You know that Genesis chapter 1. I'm, I actually alluded to this uh, earlier. Genesis chapter 1. The, the, the man is, is created. We see that from like a 10,000 foot view. But in chapter 2 we get like the 10 foot view. And we get a really specific view of Adam and Eve being created. This is back in Genesis. Now, why are we going to Genesis? Because we're using a lot of language in this passage that is kind of quotes and really uh, repetitive. And you guys know that in the Bible, uh, adjectives and adverbs aren't really used as much as the way that we use them. You always pick up on uh, things that are symbolic or things that are repeated. Okay, so instead of saying, uh, my wife is super duper hot, you would say, my wife is hot, my wife is hot. You would say it twice, and that meant something. You said it three times, she is Helen of Troy. Okay, I just, that's all I could think of, because my wife is right here. Valentine's Day. Preacher's got game, come for me for tips. Okay. Genesis 2, 20, 24, the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. Now, I could take you through, I don't have, I don't have time, but I could take you through a long list of things. And it will say uh, throughout the Bible, and this king, uh, he... He, he slept and went to be with his fathers before him. What does that mean? He died. Okay? So all over the Bible, it will say he slept. And what it really means is he died. And so there's a huge play on words right here. And, and I believe that 
uh, Adam's going to sleep is going to be representative of something. Stick with me. The Lord God made the rib. He had t- uh, uh, God took one of his ribs. Nope, where are we? I'll just go where you are. Verse 22. Okay. Did we go through all that? Go back to 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come under the man. He slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. He took one of the ribs. The word that is in Hebrew here is actually like he took from his side. We're assuming rib because later he is going to say, this is bone of my bone. So we assume that it was a rib that was taken. But really, in the original language, it just means that something came from his side. So some of you are picking up on this. Adam. Okay. Adam, who in Hebrew would be Hadam. Do you know what Hadam means? Dirt. <laughs> you ladies are like, I dig that. Okay. Uh, you're dumber than dirt. Uh, yeah, baby. Hadam. Uh, so Adam, the, the, the earth, okay, he's going to be the first man, the earth, this fertility, everything is going to grow out of that. You see how this works? And then you have uh, his wife being taken from his side while he, some of you see where I'm going with this already, but hold on. Uh, Verse 22, then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. Woman is actually an interesting word too because the same word is used for woman, for wife. So his wife, his bride, is taken from his side during his slumber. And the man said, oh, and by the way, also woman, I can't tell you what the word is in Hebrew because I can't, I, I'm, I, I don't speak it. I can't do that. Uh, but I tell you what it means. It means opposite of man. <laughs> by the way, that's one of my favorite things about my wife is that she's not a dude. Okay. And the man said, this one at last is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. So you have a picture all the way in the beginning of Adam. Now, what I didn't tell you is later... Okay, Adam is famous. He's, he's from the earth. Jesus comes to the earth. And so Adam is the beginning. And then later Jesus is going to come and he's going to be the new, the new Adam. He's going to be the new beginning. Okay? And so this is scripture. I'm not making this up. It says that he is the second Adam. He's the, he's the better Adam. He's the greater Adam. He is the greater new beginning. And so... Uh, when the beginning goes to sleep, his bride is taken from his side. And so Jesus comes to give us a new beginning. And when he is put to sleep for three days before he comes back, they pierced his side. What is the significance in that? Sin is only atoned for. Sin is only taken away when it is paid for by blood. And so when Jesus d- is on the cross, he dies from asphyxiation, he suffocates, it forms fluid all around his lungs. When they pierce him, blood and water come down, and that is the blood that paid for your sins. And so your husband fell asleep, and you were taken from his side. Do you understand? So marriage was all the way at the beginning, and from the beginning it has always been a picture of Jesus. It's supposed to be hard because what he had to do was hard. He forgave his bride. Guys, I know that's weird. We're the bride of Christ. He forgave his bride through all of it. We are undeserving. Yet he did it anyways, and that's our challenge to do. Better pick the right woman, guys. I'm serious. I'm giving this plea to young men. Adam. Oh, I had all that written down here, but I didn't read any of it. I just did out of memory. I'm impressed. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, if you want to see where Jesus is called the last Adam. And he is the last Adam. Because Noah was a new Adam, by the way. There was a new beginning after the ark. So Jesus is the last Adam. Okay. 
Ephesians 5.32. Let's keep going. Let's finish this. This mystery is profound. We've been talking all about husbands and wives and, 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 and all this. And it says, this mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Paul just stops in the middle of the letter. He's like, listen, you think I'm talking about marriage right now, but I'm not. I'm talking about Jesus. And so your marriage, you're going to have struggles. And I want you to see, uh, I, I, this is my second time to say this. What is the issue when the issue isn't the issue? And so you're fighting, you're angry, you're mad at one another. But what you're fighting about isn't even the issue. That's why you just keep going. That's why you bring your mother-in-law into the whole argument. That's why, because I'm looking for something that's not necessarily encompassed in the thing right now that we're fighting about. So there's an issue, but it isn't the issue. So what's the issue? What's the issue when the issue isn't the issue? It's a spiritual issue. Jesus is always the issue. At some level, I'm not doing one of two things, or we are not doing one of two things, and I'm about to bring that to you. Ephesians 5.33, and this is the last verse. To sum up, to sum up, okay, so I've always wanted Ephesians to be longer. I've always wanted it to be longer. I want to be able to do marriage counseling and have all this advice, and here's a five-step program, and this is all he gives us. Well, this is not all, but it, 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 it just wasn't long enough to teach from. And here's what he ends with. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Now, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to try to do it quickly. Uh, I have a book actually outside that we sell. Y'all know that we have uh, over sorted by the bathrooms. We have a bookshelf. Uh, prices are, are listed on those bro- books, and that just means that's what we paid for it. If you, can't, if you don't have that much money, you, there's a little box on the side put as much money in there. As, as you, oh, we don't care. That's not, we're not trying to make money out of that. We're trying to provide resources for you. And so I've got Bibles over there. We have free Bibles in the back, even better. But I have a book out there, and it is my favorite marriage book. I have a few out there. I've read every book out there, uh, minus one. Dusty is, is the one who put that one on. Uh, but all these, all these books are vetted by me. Oh, and the women's devotional. I didn't do that one either, full disclosure. My favorite marriage book is called Love and Respect, and it is from right here. This is interesting, okay? Uh, love and respect. Why didn't he say, hey, guys, just love each other? In summary, love each other. Or why didn't he say, in summary, respect each other? He said, he said wives are to respect their husbands, and husbands are to love their wives. Now, uh, there are some things that we do as men and women uh, sort of on the bell curve. It's kind of an 80-20%. So when we throw things and say, well, women all do this, some of you are like, I don't do that. For example... Uh, if I say fits of rage, guys or, or girls, typically a guy, but some of you ladies are like, oh, whoa, you hadn't seen me when somebody cuts in line at Target, okay, and, and so we, that bell curve, like it's going to be an 80-20 thing, that doesn't mean that you're not feminine because you have this, what, what about this, what about, this? and I, there's a reason I use this, nag. Now, is that always women? I'm going to tell you, in my relationship with my wife, I'm the nag. That doesn't make me feminine, okay? So take this all with a grain of salt. I'm bell curve. That's why I use that, because I wanted to put myself down there, okay? But bell curve, we don't work on the same currency, and so in, and, and, and this, is, this is all in the book, I encourage you to read it, but uh, it's, it's all based out of Ephesians 5. When we do surveys and we say in this scenario, how did you feel, 80% of the time women will say, he could not do this if he loved me. And 80% of the time men will say, she would not do this if she respected me. We, in general, now I need love too. My wife needs respect too. Bell curve. Nobody panic about this. We, in general, work on a little bit different currency. And God made us to be that way. And he knew that, which is why he said, husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Because there are things that we do, and I say, that felt disrespectful to me. I could do the same thing, and my wife could say, how could you do that if you love me? Right? And so what happens is I treat my wife disrespectful. Uh, 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 I, I do something that's unloving to her, 
And so she's not super pleased about that. And her reaction in return doesn't feel super respectful. So I feel disrespected. So in return, I do something that definitely does not seem loving. And so not to be outdone, we further the disrespect, right? And so we play this game of ping pong, but it is going down like a gumball machine at Pizza Heaven. We are spiraling down. Okay? And so I receive disrespect, and I reply with unloving behavior. She receives unloving behavior and repli replies with disrespect. And that may not even be how it is, but that's how it's perceived. And so that's why we respond in the way that we do. Now, I don't have time to go into, we call it the crazy cycle. This is the crazy cycle of love. And so the goal is to get off the crazy cycle, which spirals down, and onto the energizing cycle, which spirals up. Okay? That's the goal. But love and respect. Remember, he's not talking about marriage. What's he talking about? Christ and the church. Worship team, I want you to go ahead and come up. And this is the boat that we're all in, okay? There is someone, it may just be a coworker. We might not even be talking about a marriage right now. There is someone that I am treating disrespectfully because I felt disrespected. And so maybe that's perceived as unloving, whatever. There's somebody who's treated you unlovingly, and so you respond negatively. Church, Jesus came to die for you, and we murdered him. And what was his response? The ultimate gift of love. Well, what about respect? He came to serve you, God. The hero came to serve the villain. It doesn't get more respectful than that. So why do I do these things? Because my fellow man and my beautiful bride deserve it? Because God deserves it. And, for, and, and some days that's the only reason I can think of. I didn't get an amen. Some days it's the only reason I can think of. Church, that's enough. That's enough reason to do it. Because that's what God wants from me. I have so much more to say. But I want this to change your view. I want you to go home and look at your partner. I want you to go home and look at the person that's really crawling under your skin as a son or daughter of Jesus. And out of fear and reverence for my God, I want you to submit to them and see if it does not completely change the relationship. In the same way that Christ died for all, I show that respect and I show that love to all. Especially especially the one who signed up to paint this picture with me of Christ in the church. I want you to see it differently. I want you to see it differently. I want you to recognize I am responding negatively and I should be responding in the way that Jesus responds, and I'm going to end this. And uh, Egridge, uh, Emer Egerson, I don't, the author's name is weird, uh, of, of this book, he says something I think is brilliant. He said, you know, when I'm on this downward spiral, the question is, who gives in first? I love his response. He says, the most mature. Whoever's the most mature, you break the cycle. And that may not be in a marital relationship. It may be a different relationship. But church, we need to break that recycle out of reverence, out of fear for our God. And that's enough reason. And the end result is a better ship. Lord, thank you for your church, your people. Lord, thank you for all those who are here that you love. Thank you for loving us when we didn't deserve it. Lord, thank you for, uh, for everyone here. Lord, we all have a bad experience in relationships. And, and you have had a bad experience in relationship with all of us. God, because we have failed, but you've forgiven us, and we are so thankful for that. 
We are so thankful for that. We are thankful for second chances. We are thankful for the last Adam who came and brought us as your bride. Thank you, God, because it all points to you. And we praise you. We ask all, all the things for this week, God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Listen, you have bad past experiences in relationships. I've been terrible in relationship before. We've all got that. This is for from this point forward. If you walk out of here feeling down today, that's not what I wanted you to hear. If you walk out of here going, I got a new way to look at this, now we're on the right path. Because we all have to come to that at some point. So I hope that this encourages you, that this inspires you to go and view relationships differently. Next week, we will not be here, okay? This is a good thing. Many of you have someone that maybe you've invited to church, or maybe even that's you today. You say, listen, this place gets so crowded that it's a little bit uncomfortable. Right now, we have about 320 chairs out. Next week, we will have about 750 chairs out, okay? We are moving literally two driveways down. We'll have people there parking you, showing you exactly where to go. It's super simple, incredible venue. We will be at the Ranger College Auditorium, okay? It's going to fit us beautifully. Uh, the college has been incredibly kind uh, to let us go over there and, and use that, and you're really going to like it. It's a state-of-the-art place. It's, it's so cool. But nothing to be afraid of. It's just going to be just like when you come in here. We'll have coffee and donuts the whole nine yards. Somebody will open the door for you and set you into your seat. Nothing changes except for that you have a way to invite. Okay? Because somebody who was uncomfortable because it's so crowded is not going to be crowded now, okay? We are going to be talking about this. Man, we're, we're in a new ship next week, okay? And you're like, thank God, no more relationships. That was intense. Uh, we are in a new ship next week. I'm so pumped about it. I'm not going to tell you what it is because you're going to be like, that doesn't sound good. I'm telling you it's good, okay? We got a new ship for next week. Please be inviting someone. Uh, this is going to be a, a great opportunity. We'll be there for just a few months. And then we will come back here, and this place will be larger and able to fit us. Okay? So that's the game plan. So next week, two more, two more entrances down, and uh, we'll be in the college auditorium. Very easy to get to. No problems. Okay? Please stand and worship with us.